Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Good evening and welcome to uh, College Prayers uh, for Brazenose. In fourth week, uh, it seems that term is going very quickly in spite of this unusual situation we find ourselves in. And it's a real pleasure this week in continuing our theme this term of the philosophy of religion that we invite uh, Reverend Dr Hugh Jones, the vicar of St Nicholas Church in Lincoln, to talk to us about religious experience and the psychology of religion. Uh, his sermon's entitled Visions of Heaven. So we look forward to that this evening. You should, as usual, find all the words that you need on the screen, on the slides, and also the uh, link to the responses and the praises on the bottom of the YouTube link. Our uh, collection, our charity collections this term continue to be uh, for the National Emergencies Trust. So please do, if you haven't already done so, look at the Just Giving page and offer whatever you can to contribute to uh, those in need in this in this country. So without further ado, let's begin our worship this evening. Let's, let's be conscious of the great peace that God offers us in our hearts and our minds, in our whole bodies. And that God desires to give us that peace and for us to share that peace with others. So let's Let's still our hearts and minds and prepare to worship. Let us confess our sins. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no help in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises, declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and have given power and commandment to his ministers, to declare and pronounce to all people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent, and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance, and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and thou mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise 
first lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 28. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give one tenth to you. Here ends the first lesson. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. For he hath regarded of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath magnified me And holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He hath showed strength with his arm. hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, hath holpen his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, 
as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The reading is taken from the Gospel according to St Mark, chapter 9, beginning at the second verse. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. Here ends the second lesson. Lord, now let us go, thy servant, depart in peace, according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared. his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
light and our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord. And by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty and Heavenly Father, we desire thy loving kindness upon this, our well-loved society. We implore thy blessing on its members, who now serve thee in their several callings. Strengthen them, O Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, and, as thou hast called them to thy service, make them worthy of their calling. And we pray for ourselves that we may learn here to know and to do thy will, that through thy protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul, to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. O eternal God, the resurrection and the life of all them that believe in thee, trust in thee, and serve thee, thou that art always to be praised, as well for the dead as those that are alive, we give thee most hearty thanks for our founders and benefactors, by whose bounty and charity we are brought up to religion and the studies of good learning, and particularly for Edward Darby and John Cheshire, our benefactors, beseeching thee that we may so well use these thy blessings to the praise and honour of thy holy name, that at last we, with them, may be brought to the immortal glory of the resurrection. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
I'd like to start by thanking the chaplain for her kind invitation to preach at BNC this evening. I'm sad not to be able to do so in person. I am instead sitting in Lincoln talking to my computer. I seem to do a lot of that at the moment. Julia has asked me to reflect this evening on the subject of religious experience. Most often this phrase refers to individual experiences of a specifically religious or mystical kind, perhaps quite dramatic and florid ones, such as those that we've just heard described in our two Bible readings. But as I'll try to show in the life of faith, it's important to interpret all experience as in some way religious. First, though, it seems to me to be important to acknowledge that these intense experiences, these dramatic stories, present very particular difficulties. And I want to begin by unpacking why we find them problematic. For many of us, anything with a whiff of the transcendent or supernatural prompts a degree of scepticism. The anatomy of this scepticism, I suggest, is a set of ideas about what sort of thing the world is, about how we come to know anything about the world and about what sort of beings we ourselves are. I'll say a little bit more about each of these. One idea that underlies much of our scepticism about religious experiences is that the world is something like a machine. It is made up of physical components and its operations can be explained by the principles of its construction without appeal to any ghost in the machine. A related idea is that we come to know about this world by sensory experience, especially the systematic gathering and analysis of experience in the activity we call science. A final idea is that human beings are susceptible to self-deception, hallucination, error and charlatanism. This susceptibility is felt to require a general bias in favour of scepticism, with particular suspicion needed when claims of an outlandish character are under consideration. Well, I hope it won't surprise you too much, notwithstanding my being a Christian priest, that I believe that all of those ideas are in very large measure true. But I do think there is more, quite a lot more, to say. The most important thing to get clear, it seems to me, is that we can never experience the world as it actually is. What we experience is shaped by our biological history, both as a species and as individuals, by our cultural background, by our previous life events, by our education. It is also shaped, I believe, by our faith commitments by what we intentionally decide to credit as real or not real, as possible or not possible. We understand a lot more about the human brain now than when I studied psychology at Oxford back in the late 1980s and early 1990s. We recognise that the way that events outside of us are represented in the brain is as shaped by biology as anything else that happens in our bodies. To take a simple example, we perceive a world made up of solid objects with definite edges in empty space, not because that is how the world actually is, but because that is what most helps us to function in our environments. Much of what we think of as out there is actually in here. Our sense of ourselves as occupants of our bodies is itself misleading. So some of how we experience the world is already wired in to our brains and it can take a gargantuan effort to persuade ourselves that the reality is different. The study of perceptual illusions gives vivid examples. It's simply impossible not to see these two central lines as different lengths. And it can be genuinely unsettling when it is revealed that they are the same. 
More shape is given to how we experience the world by our personal histories, including our education. But where it risks becoming controversial is when we turn to the possibility that we may choose some of what we believe about the world and that these choices, these faith commitments also play a role in shaping our experience. So let's apply that back to the question of religious experiences. I've suggested that what we experience depends on a range of factors, one of which might be the explicit intentional commitments that we make to believe that certain things are possible and others are impossible. If I'm on the right sorts of lines with this, it helps to explain further why we find the stories of supernatural experiences and events in the pages of the Bible so difficult. These are reports of human experiences that reflect categories of understanding that are not available to us. Our own categories were certainly unavailable to them. We are coming to these reports, in other words, with a different set of beliefs, not necessarily religious beliefs, about what can and cannot be. That, in turn, helps us to walk around the trap of arrogantly assuming that they were credulous, primitive and stupid, while we are sceptical, smart and sophisticated. So how we interpret an experience, our own or someone else's, requires a sensitivity to the way in which that experience has been shaped by the various factors I've mentioned. And if we try to do that with respect to the religious experiences of a Jacob at Bethel, or of the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, or indeed in this Easter season of those who encounter the risen Christ, one specific faith commitment seems to me to emerge as a constant. These experiences were reported by people who believed that God is present and active in the world, that God reveals God's self to us in a variety of ordinary and extraordinary experiences. That, in turn, demonstrates that the real difference between people who believe in God and people who don't is that the former believe that the final answer to the question why is because God rather than just because. This is not to invoke a ghost in the machine, but rather to say that the reason there is and continues to be a machine at all is God. And that brings me back to the suggestion I made very early on, namely that for a person of faith, all experience is religious. To be a person of faith is to believe that God is as visible in the first snowdrop as on the mountain of transfiguration, as audible in the kind words of a stranger as in a dream at Bethel. The belief, to give a final example, that every human person is created and loved by God, including myself, may influence how I experience my relationships in ways no less transforming than the most profoundly mystical encounters. And imagine, just imagine, what dreams might come true if a commitment to that idea were to be universal. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of love and hope, you made the world and care for all creation, but the world feels strange right now. The news is full of stories about coronavirus. People are worried that they might get ill. Others are anxious for their family and friends. Be with them and help them to find peace. We pray for the doctors and nurses and scientists and all who are working to discover the right medicines to help those who are ill. Thank you that even in these anxious times, you are with us. Help us to put our trust in you and keep us safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask you to watch over people of all faiths across the world. Strengthen their belief in hope. Be the fulfilment of their love for one another. 
we give thanks for the compassion which all faiths teach and share, and for the amazing work of everyone giving up their time and risking their safety to help others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray that you watch over the community of Brasenose. We pray for the safety of Brasenose students and staff and their families. Although we may be separated across different countries, we are one college family. We pray that our care and support for one another will continue to thrive as we face new challenges and uncertainties together. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. May the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. Thanks be to God. Just want to say an enormous thank you to everyone who's contributed to the service, not least uh, Hugh and all of our musicians. Um, beautiful anthem this evening. Thank you very, very much indeed. Also a notice uh, from Christian that if you would like to contribute still to the fourth week concert, please email him. You've got a day left. He needs your uh, contributions by Monday of fourth week, which is the 18th of May. So you've still got time. If you uh, on your own or with other members of your family would like to produce something, please uh, let him know as soon as possible. Thank you. Have a really lovely week.